I was just streaming, you know, I uh, didn't know anything. And then the next thing I heard was this announcement <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, it was crazy, you know? So this is something special. This is big and this is positive. And it was, you know, it was, it was, um, yeah, it was big. So I, I, uh, straight away, I was like, right, I got, I got to know, I got to know more about this. What, 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 you know, how did this all come about? But very quickly, I was like, I'm, I'm going to El Salvador, right? And I've got to go and I got to go see what this is about. I found, I, you know, heard about Bitcoin Beach. Graham, you're back here in El Zante. How's it feel? Back in El Zante, yeah. No, it feels good. It feels really good. Um, got in a couple of days ago, and uh, it always feels good coming back. So, yeah, super happy and uh, excited about, well, excited to be here having this chat. And then we got, obviously, we got the uh, Adopting Bitcoin coming up in the next couple of days. So, yeah, it's good to be back. Yeah, I'm always excited about adopting Bitcoin. It's just a, a very special conference. It's, of course, I'm biased. And, you know, this is hometown and uh, it's in El Salvador, but it, it just has a different, very special feel to it. It feels like real Bitcoin, less commercial. Right. Um, so. I, I hear you exactly. That that first one actually, where we we uh, we we actually filmed for, you know, part of the the documentary. That was amazing, right? That that first that I mean, they've, they're all good. They're all good, but that there was something a bit special about that that one, twenty twenty one, and uh, you guys are up on stage. You were one of the first people up on stage, and uh, there was just the atmosphere. That the, the law had just come in, right? Just like two months before, and uh, there was just a. Yeah, the atmosphere was like electric. Oh yeah, it was. Know? I remember it was like it was amazing. It was like this was history being made. Right. Everybody there felt like they were part of something special. Exactly. Had you already picked the the name for the documentary at that point? Was no. That, okay. No, no, we hadn't. We didn't uh, had no idea at that point. And we always said, you know, let's make the film, and then as we're making it, it'll probably you know the name will probably jump out, and that's yeah, that's what happened. So I'm, I'm trying to remember timelines. So much has happened since then. But were you guys filming the week before? Did you come back for the conference, or when? When? What was the kind of uh, trajectory of the the filming? We we were filming for the whole of uh, November. So we were here for for that month. So we would no, we were down in El Zonte filming first, and then then went to the conference. I can't remember the exact dates, but I think it was around the middle of November. The the um, the conference. So yeah, so it was uh, we we filmed before, during, and after. Yeah. So you you did it. You you made the film. You followed through. You uh, got distribution on it. I mean, all the things that you know. A lot of people have ideas, but it's rare for people to actually be able to follow all the way through and to make it all happen. So uh, I'm sure for you, it's exciting to come back here, almost like a, a victory lap of, <laughs> of being able to, you know, be out there and promoting the film. And uh, it's, I got to say, it came out amazing, much better than I had anticipated. I, you know, I knew it was when it was kind of a first project for you. And, you know, there's been a lot of films done in El Salvador. So I was like, yeah, that's that's great, but I wasn't, you know, as excited about it as I am now that it's come out. And I'm like, wow, you guys really hit it. You hit all the marks. It catches things that I think a lot of the other, you know, documentaries about what's happened here missed. So congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was one of those things. It all just came together, you know, like. Um, you know, we'll probably get into get into more of the background and everything later on. But it was just a it, it you know everything just seemed to fall into place, and uh, yeah, it was it, it it came out well. And it's like you say, it's great to be back, and and it, it feels very you know this is the first podcast I've done sitting down face to face with someone, and it feels very appropriate to to be doing it here in El Zonte with you. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's great. It's great to be back and great that it, 
came out and the uh, the distribution we got, which was, uh, well, we'll get into all of that as well. But um, yeah, it's, it's uh, it, it feels good. Now we just got to get people to watch it. <laughs> well, I was happy that you were willing to come on. I know uh, originally you were trying to kind of remain anonymous and and do everything uh, without people seeing your face. But but I think it's it's so important, you know, of a project that you need to be out there promoting it. And so I'm, I'm glad you're kind of, I know that's a sacrifice to, you know, to, to give up, you know, some of your, um, you know, personal information, people know who you are, but I'm, I'm stoked to see you out there. Thank you. Yeah. Well, as I, was, I said to you earlier, you know, like I, I had in my previous life been out kind of like always having to, I, I ran a business for a while and, you know, just a small business. And so I was, you know, on LinkedIn all the time. I was always out there. I was doing kind of public speaking, going to conferences. And, um, you know, I kind of enjoyed it. It's not really my, you know, like, you know, some people thrive in that kind of world. And, um, but when it, when I, when all of that kind of came to an end, it was, it, it was like, ah, oh, it's so nice to, to be low key and, you know, forget all the social media stuff. And, so I, I'd kind of given up on, it's like, yeah, this is, this is it now for me. I'm just going to stay, uh, you know, hidden in the shadows. Um, so yeah, when I did the, when I, you know, when we started off with the documentary project, I was like, yeah, that's cool. I'll just be, you know, anonymous, right. That kind of fits with the whole vibe of Satoshi and then, you know, the, the donor and stuff in the, in the Bitcoin beach story. So I was like, I'll just be the anonymous, you know, Bitcoin producer. Um, but I hadn't thought it through. Right. And so then when it actually came out, I was like, all oh, right, so now somebody has got to get out there <laughs> and promote it. And that's got to be me. So, um, yeah, I had to give up the anonymity and, um, uh, but you know, Hey, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's fine as well. Yeah. I and mean, it actually is kind of enjoyable as well to be able to, it was a bit, you know, a little bit cloak and dagger before, you know, like having to sort of say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm kind of anonymous. So now, I'm, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a little bit liberating. Yeah, I'm, I'm out there. I'm gray and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I'm kind of wired a little bit the same. I'm, I'm more of an introvert. I, I don't necessarily get invigorated by being on the screen or doing interviews or any of that stuff, but I understand the importance of it. And so if you don't have a, a public platform it's really hard to get the message out there and get the story out there yeah exactly exactly i mean i think you know i i ended up doing a lot of kind of looking into how do you how do you get a film out there how do you promote it and all that. and you know no nobody recommends <laughs> to go anonymous right no one says right the best way to promote your film is to you know no, no quite the opposite so yeah it's uh, it, it is what it is so this was like a first time thing for you. You're not a film producer by trade. So love to get a little bit of your background. You said you mentioned that you had your own business before. So what was that? And did that kind of bring you into Bitcoin or were you kind of running a parallel course there? What's, what's a little bit of your backstory? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know how far you want to go back, but I was, you know, I'm from well, the where, where are you from? from the, like, okay. <laughs> I'm from the UK. Okay. I was born in London. Um, and, uh, my, I had a kind of, uh, you know, interesting, uh, childhood. My, my father was a chemical engineer. He moved around a lot when, uh, when I was a kid. So we lived in kind of these weird, wonderful places. Like um, outside of London or oh, outside of the UK. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he worked in the oil industry. So we, we actually, my first, after being born in London, my first months, uh, I was in, uh, I ended up in a little town in Oklahoma somewhere. Oh, really? <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then we moved to the Middle East and okay. uh, lived in Bahrain and then Iran. And um, and then eventually moved back to Europe and lived in Italy for a while. And then uh, my, my father-in-law was in, in the oil industry. So my wife kind of had, oh, okay. she, it, was, it was more domestic, but, you know, she was like in New Orleans and then Texas. Right. And then... They wound up actually in California at the end. I think Chevron had their headquarters. Okay, out there. Right, but right. Yeah, she was always moving around, and I, they wanted to send her dad. Actually, I think he had a plant in the UK too. That was one of the because he okay. did. Um, 
like one of I think he ran some refineries, and so I think there was one in the UK, and they wanted the Simon overseas, but uh, my my mother in law was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, you, you can get posted into you know in you know in the oil industry and in all sorts of kind of crazy places. Like I say, we ended up in Iran, and then we we got out of Iran when the the. Uh, so when were you in Iran? That was in the seventies. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it was in the the days of the Shah before. The, and uh, do you remember that? Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, no, I, you know, I, I uh, not, not a huge. I mean, amount you of don't it, look, have, you don't look old enough to remember it too well. Yeah, so. I was young. I mean, I have, I have, you know, just, just some, some individual memories. I don't remember it that well. I was, I was probably only like five years old or something. Um, but, um, but yeah, I have some vivid, I have some, you know, vivid memories of uh, Tehran, which is where we lived. Um, yeah, so, uh, so moved around and then did you go to school or what was the kind of trajectory from there? Yeah. And then, well, we ended up in, uh, when I was about eight years old, I think we, we moved to Spain and, um, about the same, about that same time they, uh, decided, cause I kept moving from one school to another, you know, when I was, you know, young, when I was a really youngster and then so about eight years old they uh you know decided to send me to boarding school in england and so uh, i did that so they were me. living in spain yeah and you went to boarding school in england yeah and did that until uh yeah i was 18 or something and then uh went to well it was about then i started getting the travel bug so just after i left school and i just i was one of those people who just uh you know, I was a curious guy. I just wanted to like see the world, learn everything from different cultures. And, and, um, so I, I started traveling and, but kind of doing university in, in London at the same time I did, well, like I did a gap year and I traveled to all around Latin America and then went to university in London. So do you speak fluent Spanish then? If you were More or less. Spain? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, I wouldn't say perfect, but I, yeah, pretty good Spanish. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so that was uh, I, 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 you know, I guess that curiosity en ended up playing into a little bit into the kind of Bitcoin story of like you know just wanting to learn and wanting to understand what's going on in the world. Um, but you know, we'll come to that. But uh, yeah, so I, I I traveled a lot, and then I ended up um, like having to at one point go right. You know, I got to actually start traveling and try and get a job and. Uh, <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to do, and uh, I. But I ended up uh, getting into sort of marketing in the UK and living in London. And um, I knew it wasn't really like my, you know, I, well, I, it was it was okay. But I moved from, basically. I went. I got into marketing, and then that eventually led into more like sort of product design, development, and uh, kind of innovation, and. Um, and then I ended up uh, in back in Spain and moved back to Spain. Where, and, where in Spain were you? Uh, Barcelona. Yeah. And so I ended up living in Barcelona for nearly 10 years and running a running a, a consultancy there um, and in product development, innovation. And it was about that time I was I, I started getting into into the whole Bitcoin thing as well. So. Um, but although the, the kind of backstory to that started really when I was in London, um, because uh, before I got into Bitcoin, I, I, I was one of those kind of uh, precious metals guys, right? I got into the whole gold and silver thing first. And so I was kind of primed for Bitcoin when it came along. Um, yeah, so that's uh, the, the, uh, the, I guess the rabbit hole story starts really when I was, uh, when I was in London. I was uh, I was early uh, silver and gold person. My my dad got me into that, but he had he had horrible timing. So he he you know he always pushed us to buy when it was like at the top. So <laughs> I was I remember buying silver when it was I don't know it was like at twelve dollars an ounce, and then for the next twenty years it was like at three, four, five dollars. Right, an ounce, right. So. <laughs> uh, it's funny. Yeah. No, I got. I got into it because um, there was like a, a big precious metals bull market that started around the early 2000s, right? And yeah. And went up to about 2010, 11, just after the crisis. And so I kind of, I got into it back then. And because I, yeah, I mean, I basically, when I was in London, I, I that was when, for me, I, I started like really 
questioning what was going on in the world, questioning the, the financial system. Um, it started actually I, I, when I kind of got my first decent job with a decent salary, and I was like, everybody was buying flats and houses, right? And they, I was like, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't really want to go down the debt, get get a mortgage kind of route, you know, and. But I, was that when there was kind of the housing bubble, and what did that? Yeah, well, it was it was the kind of early part of the bubble, okay. I guess. So it was, I, and was that happening in the UK also? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I remember having friends here, friends that were like public school teachers, and they were buying like, you know, oh, we just bought our third house, and this was in California where you know things weren't cheap. And right. I was thinking, how, how is this even real? They're like, no, you just tell them what your income is. You don't have to actually have it. They just, right, they exactly. tell you like, you don't hey, need you, you have to tell them, you have to say you make 200,000 a year. And I'm like, but don't you make like 60,000 a year? Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't matter. You just tell them that you make 200,000 and they, they know, like they're all in on it. And I was thinking, this is not gonna end well. It's but insane. it lasted much longer than I right, thought. I right. mean, I this was like a few years before it actually fell apart. And then I kept thinking, well, maybe I'm the idiot because it just kept going up. And, <laughs> but eventually, it uh, you know, you, you always got to pay the price. Right. Exactly. No, well, that was that was exactly it. And there was there was a uh, I don't know if it was the same in the U.S., but there was like TV programs all the time about buying houses. Oh, yeah. You know, like yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. I mean, people that I knew that like. You know, we're like delivering pizza the year before. Now we're like mortgage brokers making just crazy <laughs> amounts of money. Right. And, and I remember talking to them. They're like, I'm like, they weren't paying their taxes. I'm like, eh, this is not. <laughs> but they were just not used to it. It was yeah. like all of a sudden they had all this money and they right. get this hundred thousand dollar tax bill at the end of the year and they had spent it all. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like well, that was it. Time. It was it was hard to kind of resist because, er, like you say, oh yeah, everybody you felt everybody stupid was doing if you it. weren't right. part of it. Everyone was like, buying these beautiful yeah. flats. So they, you know, like there were people that were kind of my my peers who were like early, you know, one of the you know first first job, whatever, not earning, you know, not earning really good money, and then they were all buying these, you know. And so at one point, I thought, okay, I, I, I better go and at least, you know, I thought maybe I'll maybe I'll do this. Maybe I'll buy a flat. Let's, let's go and have a look at some. You know, so I put a, put together a budget, not based on a fake salary, based on my real salary. Yeah. At what I, you know, I think it was like they used to say three and a half times the the salary or something like that, um, which then later became more like six times the, the salary or something. But um, anyway, so I put a, put together what I thought was a reasonable budget, and then when when and you know got some agents to show me a few places, and I I was so shocked at how little you could get, you know, for what I thought was was a pretty you know sizable amount of money and 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 then that that was what like started for me it was like this doesn't make sense this doesn't make sense how can and i'd never really questioned the monetary system before right this i'd never really questioned the debt based system and um and so that was it i kind of abandoned the house search and i i started going down like how does this all work and starting you know to learn about our financial system, our monetary system, and uh, yeah, and then and so I, the more I learned, the more shocked I became. I was like, "This is, this is insane." I, you know, how 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 can no one knows about this? How come they're not teaching uh, how you know how our monetary system works at school? But then, but then at the same time, it's like, well, I, I kind of know why they're not teaching it because you know it's. Uh, it's just a big Ponzi scheme. Um, yeah, it's a big Ponzi scheme that that's kind of rigged to to you know uh, you know to enrich uh, certain certain people, not others, and and so yeah, that's that's how and so that's it was at that point where I started buying gold and silver. And funnily enough, you know, one of the characters that has become a bit of a, a kind of cartoonish character in Bitcoin world, which is Peter Schiff. Right, is uh, he was someone that back then was making a, a lot of sense. I mean, he still makes sense yeah. e economically. Just his whole Bitcoin thing is a bit a bit insane. Um, but but yeah, so I was uh, he was you know he used to go on these uh, you know kind of finance uh, TV shows and, and get laughed at for predicting that this crisis was going to come, and um, he was right, you know. And uh, so I was I was kind of. Uh, paying attention to him, and as I say, that's, what, uh, what's your theory on him? Is it is his is his inability to accept Bitcoin? Is it just him talking his book, or is he just 
so like tunnel vision there that he can't get beyond. Yeah, it's funny. We were talking about this. Uh, I was with Chimbera last night and a few others uh, having dinner when this exact subject came up. And um, yeah, I I thought initially he was just very tunnel visioned and very and very stubborn, you know, and just like all his you know his clients were gold. You know, he got a lot of clients into yeah. gold and whatever. But by the end, I think he was because what happened, right, is he started getting a lot of donations from Bitcoiners. And um, and so in the end, I, I started thinking and then he claimed he lost he lost it all right that he'd uh, or he he lost his password or something. And I don't know, I think maybe he was talking up his, <laughs> his book, you know, and because it was a very good way to keep yeah. getting donations. If you keep being that character, because he was going, he was turning up at all these Bitcoin conferences, doing these debates, right? And like, and the more he debated, the more he seemed to get <laughs> donations. So, um, yeah, because you've seen other people like like Kitco, they've always been big in the, the metal space, but they've kind of shifted mm. to incorporate Bitcoin also and, and to see them as, as not necessarily being, you know, in, in like in war with each other, but like they're 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 both hard money principles and one, you know, obviously I think Bitcoin's better, but so it's it's interesting because you see a lot of people in the hard you know in the metals community have come along to bitcoin but there's some that just can't like it's right exactly i mean it's to me it's a bit you know the the whole kind of like you know that they have to be kind of poles apart and that they're enemies is doesn't yeah. make sense there's a you know we're on the same side really um but obviously to me now bitcoin makes far more sense um than gold i still own some gold but um, it's a tiny, you know, proportion of the, my overall kind of, um, you know, uh, assets. So, well, one of the biggest challenges with with the metals is to actually hold them yourself. It's it's a pain hey, in the butt, exactly. and you you pay a premium to the market <laughs> price, and so you never know if you're getting ripped off, and exactly. you, know, you have all kinds of theft issues. I mean, it's it's much harder to deal with than Bitcoin. Oh, it's a nightmare. I mean, exactly that. It actually, it really helps kind of crystallize why, you know, another one of the, the, the amazing uh, attributes of Bitcoin, right? Yeah. Which is that you can move it. Well, you don't have to, you don't have to move it. You just need to move yourself and your private keys and your, you know, and your seed phrase, or whatever. But yeah, it's it's uh, it's incredible the difference. Like you say, I I own a bit of gold, but it's I hate it. I hate owning it because it's just a you know pain of like yeah. where do you keep it? And especially someone I I kind of move around quite a yeah. lot. <laughs> so <laughs> do I carry? Do I move it around with me? Do I just leave it in a you know leave it in a deposit box or in a house, or whatever? You know, it's a, so yeah. No, I remember a few years ago I thought well I'm getting you know have pretty much everything in Bitcoin. Maybe I should buy a little gold. But then like I was reminded of all the shortcomings of gold. Right. I was like, forget it. This is just <laughs> exactly. too much of a hassle. Yeah, but, exactly. No, Bitcoin is so much yeah. easier. And then even if you, you know, if at some point, because that's the thing, everyone like you says, well, you know, gold's kind of the ultimate insurance policy, right? It's like, you know, if all else fails. But then if all else fails, you know, like really is that who's going to be buying your gold and you're going to be able to you know it's so non-divisible that's another thing right so if you got one a one ounce coin right which currently is two thousand dollars well if all else fails and you want to go and buy a bag of rice <laughs> you know a, a, a two thousand dollar coin um which would probably be a lot more if you know yeah so that that doesn't make sense either right it's and so yeah it's uh there's a lot of a lot of reasons why you know gold doesn't really make any sense anymore and i and i i'm no doubt that you know that the 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 stagnation of gold that we've had over the last 10 years whilst bitcoin has come onto the scene has has played a part in that yeah. right as uh more and more there's people. a better option now. yeah it used to better, be you exactly. know all that would just flow into gold right so yeah exactly yeah, yeah and i think that's part of you know even I think that's why some of the metals people don't like Bitcoin because they, you know, they right. think that their bags would be uh, pumping right now. Right. For Bitcoin. Exactly. Yeah. I feel sorry for some of the, yeah. <laughs> some of those old kind of gold silver bugs, you know, that they, uh, they, they really like dug in and, you know, and 
I don't well, know. It's become a pride issue for him, I think. They yeah. just don't want to like... Exactly. Ex yeah. Did you ever come across um, something called King World News? No, okay. I don't think so. So there's a, there was a, 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 a like a, a website, you know... Um, a newsletter service? Yeah, like a, I guess a, like an early version of a, a, of a sort of podcasting uh, thing where they did like interviews... And they were all with gold and silver bugs. And uh, I used to like listen to it religiously, like every every uh, Saturday, because that was the thing. It wasn't like, it was like every Saturday, they had like three or four interviews or something with different people. And, um, you know, it's hilarious. Like I, I, I the other day I kind of, so I wonder what happened with those guys, you know? And I went back on the website. It's still the same, the same people say the same things, you know, and this is like, you know, nearly 15 years later yeah. or something, you know, <laughs> so. So um, you were, you were in the metals world and then how did, how did Bitcoin come into that? Like it? So, yeah, so I, I was doing, uh, I mean, I was just in, um, uh, I, I'd, by, by the time, so it was around 2010 that I came across Bitcoin and um, I was in Spain by that time. Uh, it was obviously, that was, uh, it was, there was the, the uh, financial crisis had, you know, literally just sort of taken hold, right? It was early, early stages of that. And um, uh, at that, at that point, I was not working. So uh, I, I'd run, been running a small business in London, financial. That was the product development? No, thing? actually, it was another, another business. I'd been running a kind of recruitment headhunting business okay. in London. And um, obviously, that gets hit. Uh, hard when a crisis comes along recruitment's the first yeah. the first thing to to stop so that was um uh, i yeah i kind of i was working with two other i had two other partners I, I i let them get on with it and i was like i'm i'm gonna go go back to back to spain so i went to spain i didn't really know what i was doing so i actually had a lot of time in my hands so i spent a lot of time online um digging around and so it was fortunate timing uh, to be spending a lot of time online because that's how I, you know, I don't exactly remember, but I went down some little, you know, trail uh, and uh, stumbled across this uh, new new thing uh, called Bitcoin. And, you know, and I first started reading about it and like it was, you know, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not a technical type. And so, but I understood what it was meant to be solving and that it had a lot of the attributes that uh, gold has. And, and so, yeah, so I, I was when I first, you know, started thinking, oh, this is interesting. Um, and then, yeah, it was probably a, a sort of a year or so later, I, uh, I uh, decided to, to uh, take the plunge. And um, so what was that? Because because I was following at that time, but I was every time I looked into to acquiring some Bitcoin, the, the technical side of it threw me off. And I was like, this Mm. This is too much of a headache. So was that like Mt. Gox era or what was the... It was Mt. Gox era, but I didn't use Mt. Gox. Okay. I used another uh, small exchange uh, in Europe. It was called Intersango. Um, I'm I assuming that doesn't exist anymore. No, yeah. no, long long gone. I don't know if you remember, uh, it was a guy called Amir Taki. Um, he was one of very early yeah, kind of Bitcoin uh, activist uh, type. He was uh, he was on on Max uh, with with Max and uh, well, I don't know if Stacy was, but part of the Kai, he did a, something on the Kaiser okay. report many you know, right right early on. Anyway, he he him and another guy had uh, set up an exchange, and it was called Intersango. And so, um, did you have to like send the cashier's check to them or what I, was it I like was, it, I was able to they managed to have a bank okay. set up a bank account so I was able to do an actual uh, bank transfer um but it was you know it was <laughs> it was pretty crazy stuff I mean you really you know you knew that it was just like a couple of people I did, at that point I didn't know it was Amir Taki to be honest I just heard of this thing called Intersango I had no idea really whether I you know I was like well I'm gonna transfer a bit but i don't know whether i'm going to get anything you know like there was so little um real you know hard evidence of people you know actually saying yeah it's cool got my bitcoin you know like so it was all very risky um but it worked and i got my bitcoin and uh yeah so um yeah that was the that was the beginning and were there 
like there weren't even really like hardware wallets at that time. No, right? no, no. It was uh, exactly. It was only only paper paper wallets at that point. See, that uh, was what kind of I was just like. I don't understand all this, and that <laughs> unfortunately that that kept me uh, out of actually buying any Bitcoin for for quite a while. So I'm uh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, yeah, we well, were I, able to make I, that happen. I have a I have a good friend as well who who uh, helped um make you know make me do the final plunge because he 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 he'd done it and he's a bit more technical technically minded and um and so he'd got his and he was like you know he's it's like graham have you got your bitcoin yet have you got your bitcoin yet and i was like no i'm getting this is you know bitcoin was still in its single digit numbers you know and and uh i was like no i'm, I'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it and i kept putting it off and then it, i think it shot up to like 30 dollars and um and then i was like god damn it and then it came down I'm too late uh, yeah exactly <laughs> I, I, I missed, missed the boat i missed the boat uh but then it came down again and uh, i was like okay and uh, came back down into single single digits so i i uh, that was i finally did it so yeah and since you initially bought it were there like periods of time where you kind of stopped following it when it had its winter times or where were you kind of from that point on just all in uh well i was i was all in mentally mm -hmm. you know but i unfortunately not all in yeah yeah, yeah yeah <laughs> that was the thing you know like, but like, i know a lot of people bought it and then uh, the price was doing nothing and they kind of went on to other things and then the next run up they they kind yeah. of came back in did you go yeah, through that cycle no or was i was i was very uh you know i no i was i was definitely all in um uh, f from from the beginning and stayed you know very much plugged into the whole thing you know i it, the first content creators i remember were max and stacy right i i got in and then you're looking around for kind of you know people to follow and they didn't start as bitcoin right no like, i i knew them a, before that yeah. so i was already like very plugged into the kaiser report uh back you know before yeah before bitcoin and so exactly so so yeah, they they were some of the first kind of uh, you know kind of content people out there, um, especially with a decent decent platform. Yeah. Right. Uh, there was a few other you know kind of no no you know people that nobody had heard of. Obviously, the Andreas Antonopoulos was was a uh, one of the first kind of real you know big. Well, he became a big name yeah. because of because of Bitcoin, um, and uh, yeah, so. So yeah, I, I stayed. I stayed very much uh, involved, and you know, it's, it's, um, listened to so many. You know, I can't. You know, I, I can't imagine how many thousands of hours of <laughs> podcasts and interviews, and you know, whatever I've, uh, and, you know, documentaries as well that I've. Uh, and probably from and a lot of people that kind of are now the apostates that went on and and, right. and got off the rails and into other things exactly so exactly some of the you know biggest characters right ended up uh, kind of disappearing for one reason or another or or, or kind of deciding to go down a different path yeah. um so yeah some some of those early characters um what was uh God. The name forgets me. Bitcoin Jesus. What was it? The, the uh, Roger Veers. Roger Ver. Roger yeah, Ver. Roger Ver. Roger Ver. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, so you know, it was funny thinking back. Right at the beginning, it was like, oh yeah, Roger talks so much sense, you know, and and then he, uh, he, you know, as we all know, did his did his thing, and you're like, oh, what an idiot. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and then the Trace Mayer, what, what he was a you know a favorite of mine for sure um it's such a you know it's like they just can't resist it's like i know Bitcoin can't be enough for them they right the like i know crazy yeah I, you know i'd love to know what trace is you know up to these days but um but yeah so yeah i went through a lot of a lot of different personalities a lot of different uh uh yeah characters uh in the in the bitcoin space along the way and you were still running your business during this time yeah so well I, yeah so i started um well, I got a, I, I, I got a job first in Barcelona around 2011 to uh, that took me through to 2013, a couple of years there. And then I started another business um, uh, in 2013. Yeah, uh, with a with another guy in Barcelona. 
excuse me. And um, so, yeah, so that was, uh, I was through right, 2013 through to 2019 running this business. Meanwhile, in the background, you know, just uh, fixated on uh, on Bitcoin. I, funnily enough, I started uh, writing kind of uh, blogs and articles and stuff about Bitcoin, can, trying to kind of link it together with our business because we were it was a design product develop business development business and so um we uh we did quite a lot of stuff around user experience and so i really wanted to you know my dream was to get a, a bitcoin company yeah. client and design their ux you know like with this idea because that's been something that's always been a challenge in right this space. exactly exactly and so it's like ah oh, so, you know maybe we can do a, an amazing ux project um uh but it yeah so I, so, I, so what do you i mean obviously there was the need for it a lot of the ux was horrible you know especially i mean i, I still i think there's a long way to go so was it that people in the Bitcoin space just didn't think that it was important or what was the what was the challenge as far as getting Bitcoin companies on board? Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think they, well, I, a couple of things. One, I don't think they, a, a lot of the early Bitcoin companies, I think, and wallets and whatever, were started by engineering types, mm -hmm. right? And they, 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 you know, they're much more focused on making sure it works properly then you know how how if you can't uh, figure it out you're just an idiot yeah. so, so. <laughs> exactly um so yeah so i think that was part of it and then but the, to be honest there you know the, the real challenge i think with the ux side is maintaining the security right because the typical user experience designers and whatever everything's about convenience everything is about just making it easy right and so um, I don't think even the our UX designers that we had working with us would have been able to really understand and you think. You can't through. sacrifice the exactly, security. Exactly, yeah. you can't sacrifice the security, and so yeah. So it, it was. Um, I didn't. I, I didn't want to push it too much because I didn't want to also be that company <laughs> that ended up doing you know what looked like a nice UX job. But we, you know, yeah, we, somebody, we you, you open some door and everything. Yeah, we gets pulled rugged. it all up. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. You know, so yeah, no, but it was. But it was. Uh, I started writing you know uh, blog posts and stuff about uh, Bitcoin probably around 2013 or something. Um, but um, but yeah, the the they, mainly they were two separate things i had the the kind of product development design business and the and my bitcoin uh fascination you know so you you wound that down in 19 was that because bitcoin had run and you just didn't need to do it anymore or it just was a coincidence that it kind of happened at that time or what was the yeah it was a coincidence i mean the thing is that we we'd grown the business to a certain extent um but it was not like we weren't we weren't doing, you know, that well. We weren't making a lot of money. Uh, it was sometimes, you know, times were quite difficult. And so it came a point where it was, you know, two partners, uh, my the other guy and me, and we, you know, we just talked about it and we were like, look, you know, I, either, either something big's got to happen for us to really get to the next level and for us to make, you know, decent, really decent money out of this. Or maybe we, you know, maybe we sh we should think of something else, you know. And it, we'd had a good run, and it was a lot of fun. But in the end, yeah, we decided to, yeah. it was uh, time to just wind it down. And it was it, we had the, you know, we at least were able to do that. It was much better to be able to wind it down ourselves than to to be forced on yeah. us, right? So, um, so that was yeah, that was the decision we took. And that's how it is, I think, with a lot of smaller businesses that if you can't get past a certain level, you're it, you're pretty much just creating a job for yourself, but with a lot more responsibility and a lot less security. Right. And so it's, yeah, you, you kind of have to make that decision. Right, yeah. exactly. And I, and we were at a certain age as well where, I mean, you know, I, for me, I, Bitcoin was was doing well enough that I, was, I had a certain amount of f financial security. Um, but I think less so for him. And, and so, uh, you know, we, we're at that sort of age where you have to think, well, we've only got so many years left in us if we want to, if we need to go on and, and you know, do other things. Yeah. Um, so now's probably, a, you know, the, the right time to, to make that choice. 
So, and then what, were you still in Barcelona at that time? Yeah. Okay. So what was the trajectory from there? Well, so actually, yeah. So wound things down in Barcelona and then at the same time decided I, I was ready for a change and decided to move to Malta. Uh, so I moved to Malta, well, the very beginning of 2020. And, um, uh, yeah. And so that was, you know, at the time as well, Malta was sort of trying to promote itself as a bit of a, um, well, they called it blockchain. I think they actually yeah. came up with the name blockchain Island or something like that. And I remember that, <laughs> which turned out it was after be. they had their, their, you know, I think a couple of years earlier, they had that where they give everybody a haircut on the banks there. Wasn't that right. a few years before that? Right. I think, it was, I think it was a few years before yeah. that. Yeah. And yeah. then it had kind of come around and that was becoming like a hub. For, yeah. Well, they, they, they promoted it for a while, but it never really became that yeah. at, at all. Um, so, but it was, you know, I, I, but I remember out. there was a lot of companies that were trying to go there and start up and... Then once they got there, they're like, eh, they like, kind of yeah. over promised <laughs> yeah. and under delivered. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, there was nothing really happening. Um, we but I went, I went over and uh, checked it out end of twenty nineteen, and I was like, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Though, yeah, right? it's a beautiful place. Yeah. Exactly. So I was like, well, I'm gonna, you know, I'm ready for a change. I've been in Barcelona nearly ten years, and so um, yeah, and uh, you know, it was the, they have some good tax. Uh, schemes there and so uh so yeah so i made made the move and um and then uh yeah one of the very first people i bumped into within like literally a, two days of arriving just randomly bumped into adam back and uh so that was that was cool and then joined a, a, a bitcoin uh, a group there you know meetup group but unfortunately that was you know just literally i, I probably only went to like two i used to go for dinners and Went for like maybe two dinners and then um and then covid happened so uh and uh so yeah so then that that kind of changed everything and i ended up um well i, I spent i spent the first the first period of uh kind of, kind of lockdown in in malta but as soon as like you know you know it went through these different waves right and so as, as soon as it, the first sort of opening up of the after the first wave and um, they allowed some travel again and stuff. Uh, I, at that point, decided to go to um, somewhere completely different again. And so I went down to Dominican Republic and uh, where it was a lot easier and, and uh, more freedom, basically. And so, yeah, ended up, um, ended up spending a lot, a lot of time down there. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that was, uh, as I say, been moving around quite a bit, but yeah, that was the that was the, the next. And is the the goal? I mean, do you see yourself as like okay, I'm kind of retired and now just doing passion projects, or you're kind of just waiting for your next thing? And and uh, you know, in in the meantime, you saw this opportunity with the film, or how did that? Yeah. So I, uh, yeah. So at that point, I mean, I guess when I uh, moved to Malta, it was right. I'm just going to take a bit of a break and. You know, just see see what happens, and I'm not really sure whether what 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 I'm going to do next. You know, maybe I'll start another business. Maybe I'll you know I don't I just I thought I'm going to just play. You know, uh, I, I at that point I wasn't thinking right. I'm I'm done. You know, I'm uh, yeah. <laughs> over and out. Yeah. You know, uh, so I was just yeah. And then and then COVID happened, so that was like oh okay. And then so then I ended up as I say down in DR trying to just. Uh, enjoy life and get out of the, the craziness. And and then um, so 21 came around and um, I was actually back in Barcelona uh, by, um, well, another story. I had, I had a, a shoulder problem and uh, I discovered there's an amazing kind of shoulder specialist in Barcelona. And so I went back there to actually go through a whole kind of round of um, physio treatment. And, um, and so it was, the, it was when I was there that the whole Miami thing happened. The, and was El Salvador on your radar at all at that point? No, no, I hadn't heard anything about uh, you guys, Bitcoin Beach. 
uh, El Salvador was not on my radar. And so that was a like just a bolt out of the blue, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, and were you at, were you at the conference in Miami no, or so no, you were in was, Barcelona? Yeah. And I was just, I was just streaming, you know, I, uh, didn't know anything. And then the next thing I heard was this announcement <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, it was crazy, you know? So I, it was, cause that was a bit of a weird period for me. I was, um, you know, personal reasons as well, relationship and things like that and health problems, plus all the COVID stuff, yeah. which was the world was crazy. Yeah. Everything was crazy. And, and so it was, you know, you know, challenging time going through quite a lot of negativity. And, um, so this, you know, this announcement was like, wow, you know, this is, uh, this is something special. This is big and this is positive. And it was, you know, it was, it was, um, yeah, it was big. So I, I, uh, straight away, I was like, right, I gotta know, I gotta know more about this. What, 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 you know, how did this all come about? And so, yeah, I st started doing my rabbit hole kind of story, you know, rabbit hole, uh, journey on the, on, on the El Salvador thing when I was over there. But very quickly, I was like, I'm, I'm going to El Salvador, right? And I've got to go and I got to go see what this is about. I found, I, you know, heard about Bitcoin Beach. And, um, and so I couldn't go straight away because I, because my, I wasn't really fit enough to travel. And so, um, I, I went, uh, I guess a month or two later, probably yeah, just over a month or so later. Is it like August or July? I think. July. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cause I was back in the U S running cause we have a seasonal business there. So I was back in the U S doing right. that when you came. The first right. Time. Right. Okay. That's right. That makes sense. Cause yeah, I was thinking why, how come I didn't meet yeah. you? I just met. Yeah. You. Cause we would always, we'd spend like nine months here and go back for three months every year and run right. the business. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, so I, so I just met um, Roman and Jorge, uh, well, and the others, but the, the you know the those main two characters at that point, and uh, yeah, so that's yeah, that, and then that's how it. And then went. how did the movie idea come out of that? Like, what was? Yeah, so I guess going back to you know your question a, a, a minute before about passion projects, right? I, I had. I, I've always been a bit of a documentary nerd. I, I've always, you know, I love like a great, great documentary. And so I'd had this little idea, like kind of brewing for some time that maybe one day I will, you know, make a documentary. Maybe I, that's something I can do. It'd be a, but I had not really kind of explored that very seriously. I, I did at one point sort of do a little bit of, uh, thinking around maybe doing one around the, the whole cypherpunk kind of movement, sort of, you know, the, the genesis of Bitcoin mm -hmm. itself, let's say. Um, but it never materialized and I didn't, you know, I didn't pursue it. And so I came, when I went to El Salvador, I was, it was there in my head thinking, oh, I wonder if there's a documentary here, you know, but I didn't, I didn't go thinking, right, here we go. I'm going to go and, you know, pitch the idea to these guys and, so I, I came very much with that as a sort of back of the mind thing. And, um, yeah. And then it, I, I met, um, Jorge and, uh, Roman and yeah, just one day sitting in the Hope House garden, Roman, like just to, I'd been hanging around for a couple of days and he just sort of turned to me one day and was like, you know, so he was like, who are you? And what, <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> And so I was like, well, um, so I, you know, in, in kind of introduced myself properly. And, and I said, well, to be honest, I'm, I'm not really here for any particular reason other than I came to check it out and explore the, you know, explore the story. And, you know, it just sounded, sounded, uh, like a fascinating, uh, magical story. And, and then I, but I, I said, you know, what, I guess one thing that has been on the back of my mind for some time is making a documentary. So that could be something, you know, and, um, yeah. And he was like, well, funny, you should say that we've been sort of thinking about that as well. And so that will, you know, one thing led to another and, um, we, uh, we ended up coming to a, coming to a, an agreement very quickly. It was like a sort of, you know, back of the back of a napkin, uh, sort of, uh, verbal agreement. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, and then we kind of made formalize that properly over the following weeks. 
and uh, yeah, that's how it all that's how it all started. Yeah, because I think I remember when I came back, they were they were talking about it and they were super excited about it. It was you could tell they were they were very excited. I, I was less so, to be honest, just because <laughs> there was lots of people coming through doing things right. and and you know it's it's they're like yeah it's his first time he's done anything and it's like yeah that's you know there's lots of people that would love to do a movie and you know <laughs> it's not, not i wasn't negative on it but i was like yeah, yeah. maybe it'll happen probably, yeah, probably appreh not apprehensive, yeah probably. usually not even so much that but just i think just kind of like realistic like yeah come through all the time and there's been a bunch of stuff done so yeah like whatever they need we're happy to do it and showcase things but um i you know i they were like, yeah, they're going to do this and they're going to give us 90% of the profits. And I was like, eh. most documentaries don't make money. I mean, that's the, the reality of it. Just, you know, I've written a book before. I've done some other things. You just know that it's, I mean, that's not where the value of it comes from. The value comes from getting the story out there and having. And so for me, where the rubber meant the road was when I actually saw the first material you guys were in. I'm like, okay, this is like first rate material this will showcase to the world what has happened here you guys did a great job of catching it from the local perspective from you know from jorge and roman's view of things and so that's what got me excited because i felt like a lot of times that was lost with the other people that came through they right didn't, they didn't catch that element and so for me that's that's where the value is and that's and it just kept getting better and then i saw the final product and i was like oh my gosh this is you know, you always have to temper yourself because you're like, of course, I'm going to be biased because <laughs> I have a, you know, personal interest in what has happened here. But I was like, this is amazing. Everybody needs to see this movie. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, thank you. And and to be honest, I think as well, the uh, another, uh, you know, important part of that was was and, and just again, by happened by chance was having uh, John Vallis involved, right? Because so he he turned up at El Zonce at exactly the same time. To, he, Did you know him from before? No, I mean, okay. I, I knew, I, I mean, I knew his podcast. He was actually kind of one of my, you know, favorite podcasts, actually, even though he's not a huge name in the podcasting world, but he's, you know, he's certainly well, yeah. pretty well known. And, and, but he has a certain style and, 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 uh, and I and I really, uh, you know, I really liked him and, and, but I'd, I'd met him like within about half an hour of arriving at El Zonce. Uh, I got led by someone because I, I, when I turned up, I was like, I, I don't know where to go. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. I'd kind of, I went into the, I came on my own, right? And I, I went to the, the very first entrance into El Zonte. So, well, the, this side of the river where we are now, but um, there was like just nothing, right? There was just a, a couple of huts. And I, and I was like, well, is this it? I, well, yeah. <laughs> I was, um, and so anyway, somebody um, turned up and uh, I think she was an English girl. And I was like, look, I, I'm kind of heard there's, you know, the, like some kind of Bitcoin thing going on around here. And she said, oh, there are, yeah, I'll, I'll take you there. I know where there are a few of them hanging out. And it happens, they happen to be in, in Garthen, right, in the, hanging out in, the, in a bar there. So that was, I, I got led straight there as soon as I arrived. And John was, John was there. And so got talking to him straight away. This was before any talk about documentaries or anything, right? And um got on got on great with him and it, it turned out that he'd done a podcast with uh jorge and roman and so i then listened to that podcast while i was here in el zonte uh, probably the first day i was i got a, you know, and then i started like hearing about all this kind of backstory right of kind of before bitcoin even turned up there was this whole you know fascinating story of of their background and 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 you, your involvement and um, and so so yeah that was that and and then when we started talking about the documentary they were like well you know we really want John to be involved because he his kind of the the, the types of questions the questions and the line of questioning he was going down was you know that he was really drilling into all of this background right so so yeah so it, it uh, kind of kind of you know came together john john being involved and um yeah it was uh, and then you know i i took a bit of a chance with bringing on joe right i I'd, I'd done a small project with joe the director and and um back in barcelona barcelona he was he was living there as well 
And I'd done a small project with him, just like a, it was like a crowdfunding video for a, for a product that we'd, we'd been working on in my, in my business. And I just remember thinking, wow, it's really good. And I saw that he'd done a couple of small documentaries. And um, so I just, yeah, I, I had a good feeling about him, but I have to be honest, like I, I it was a bit of a chance, right? A bit of a, bit of a risk yeah. going with him. He was not like a well-known established documentary maker. And, uh, but he also, you know, I thought he, you know, he did an amazing job in everything in terms of the professionalism of, you know, getting all like all the organization of getting all the equipment over here and the crew and all, well, some of that was me as well in terms of the organization, but it just, yeah, the, it was, uh, uh yeah, a really outstanding job. And then when he came up with the, the, the first edit, let's say, I was a bit like you. I was like, okay, wow, this is really, this is really good. I, I may be biased as well, but I think, <laughs> I think it's really good. So, so how active of a role did you play, like in in creating the storyline and deciding? I mean, I know that there's tons of just amazing material that had to be cut out because else it would have been, you know, twenty hours. So, were you involved at all in in those decisions or? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I was, in, yeah, I was involved. Really, uh, I, I played a pretty, you know, hands-on role from the beginning because I, I guess it was my sort of vision, like of you know, I, I going back a, a step. I right at the beginning for me, what really hit me when I, you know, started hearing about these stories and um, the all the background and everything was that this was a really uh, amazing um, example of Bitcoin, how Bitcoin was actually changing people's lives. And so, I'd, you know, as I said before, I'd seen so much content and listened to so much content around Bitcoin, but very little about how it was actually changing people's lives, transforming, you know, having this direct impact. And so, it was, yeah, it was an opportunity here to show the kind of real human side of Bitcoin, which is ultimately what Bitcoin is about, right? It's not, it, we, we can we can marvel at the engineering and the what it solves from a kind of economical side, but what you're really trying to do is improve both individual lives and society, you yeah. know, that, that of society. And so for me, this is one, like, one of the first real examples of this actually being showcased, you know, and, and so uh, that was, so my vision was to create the, this film that was really bringing out the human side of Bitcoin and showing, showing, uh, uh, well, exactly what I just said. And so, um, so, so I was very hands on in terms of like, what kind of things we want to film, who we want to, you know, interview, um, what, because I also knew that we had to bring, that we had to have someone, not just, you know, El Zonte characters, but we needed some some people to to do some explaining yeah, of what- Kind of round it out. Yeah, exactly, of what, how, you know, why Bitcoin is relevant. And, and so all of that, um, and then, yeah, so from the kind of the vision side and the organizational side, and then through to uh, the editing side. So, you know, as first edit came out, you know, it was we, we went through those decisions very much together. Well, that seems a little bit too long winded. We could cut that down. Um, you know, that needs some music or, you know, so I was I was kind of Joe would obviously do the actual stuff, but we were we were kind of working on it very much together. Um, so it was it was, you know, it was it was fun. It was great. I just I loved it. So I'm guessing like most projects, this took way longer and cost much more than you had anticipated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the, that was the big, um, uh, you know, I was, as I say, there was something very cool about the way everything just came, yeah. you know, fell into place. And I made very much an impulsive decision as did, uh, you know, Roman and, and Chimbera, to be honest, like, as I say, we, we talked about it kind of one afternoon and then, you know, pretty much by the next day, it was like, right, let's yeah. do it, you know? <laughs> and so. I, I think that's the only way those things happen because if you actually think through it, you realize it's a bad idea. Right. <laughs> and, but it's, there's a lot of bad ideas that wind up changing the world. Like those are the things that you couldn't have, 
you know, wiser people would have told you not to do it, but it's actually in retrospect, it's the thing that moves the needle. And right. So it doesn't Ex have to make sense. Exactly. I, I think that's exactly right. If I, if I kind of like done a proper, you know, mapped it all out in terms of time, effort, money, you know, I might have like, nah, I, I, you know, this, if I if I'd known what was actually going to yeah. transpire, I might have like said, no, nah, Graham, it's not, it's probably not a good idea, you know. <laughs> well, I think but that's it, it's why a lot of times we're only allowed to see a little bit up front. I think that's that's you know because. A lot of times you wouldn't follow through on amazing things if you knew how hard it was exactly, going to be up front. Exactly. Well, I'm sure that's probably the same with with you guys, right? Oh yeah. With, with the whole <laughs> the whole project, you know, like it was. I remember you explaining it. It was kind of similar. You were like, you kind of did that rough proposal. Oh right? yeah. I thought for sure. I'm like, oh, there's other projects like this. We'll just see what they're doing and mimicking them. And then there wasn't. It was okay. We've got to actually create this and make <laughs> right, it happen. Right. <laughs> And then they, uh, yeah, they kind of gave the, the the donor like gave the the go ahead and say, yeah, yeah, let's do it. You're like, oh, oh, wow, <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was <laughs> one of actually, those like check yourself moments of you know, say, <laughs> careful what you wish for, you just might right. get it. Like, <laughs> so we're more recently we're doing an island on or a project on an island, La Paria, with where they basically went to this island, a lot of poverty, I heard about and that. yeah, and so. There was um, an amazing uh, young young couple, Quentin and Sam, that were willing to go there and do it. And I, I remember like looking at them, and they're young and ambitious, and they had all this. And I'm like, I'm glad you don't know everything that's in store for you the next six months, or you wouldn't do this. Like I knew they'd do an amazing job, but I knew it was going to be much tougher than. And I remember talking to them a few months in, and you were just like. Yeah, it's not some paradise living on this island. I mean, it was great things, but just very hard too. But yeah, they yeah. they did it and they helped transform that community, and so awesome. that's that's how those things happen. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And that were there any points along the way where you were just like, I don't know if this is actually gonna become a movie, or was it you were pot committed and it was gonna happen hell or high water? Yeah, I think once uh, once we were made the decision, it was. Yeah, it was kind of uh, all in, and the the only my only worry at one point was about the the whole COVID thing with travel, right? And and then we we had to try and get insurance to to because you know Joe's background as a as a filmmaker was you know we need to get the whole everything insured. We need you know I need my equipment insured. I need the we need a, as a crew we need to be insured, and so starting to try and. <laughs> uh delve into that yeah. you know in the middle of covid as well it was it was like you know it was very hard to find any any insurance company really looking to to uh to do that um so so that was the only that was the only hurdle eventually we we found a kind of way around it, it wasn't exactly there, there wasn't we didn't find one company who we could just like do the whole thing um but we got I think we got health insurance on the one hand and then we got you know kind of uh equipment insurance on the other and so we, we you know but apart from that yeah it was um uh pretty much committed to it and uh and what was yeah. your biggest surprise in that whole process that you know the toughest thing or the thing you hadn't anticipated that would um it's a uh, good question i guess I guess it's just the, um, the the level of detail in terms of the organization, really. You know, like it was just, yeah, you've 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 got to prepare, and you can't, you know. That I I I spoke to a, another filmmaker uh, when I was when I started off uh, because I wanted to, you know, as I hadn't done anything before, I was trying to get some, you know, uh, advice. And, and this guy had made a lot of documentaries, and he, he actually came up with some advice which i didn't take um which was he was like just, which, just which don't do it was that his first advice? well <laughs> <laughs> he was like just just if i was you just get a get a you know camera crew and just go there and just delve into it right and just just don't don't think too much about what the final result's going to be and who you need to speak to and just just go there and be on the ground and let the kind of go with the go with the flow and but joe was 
didn't really, you know, he was like, no, I think we need to plan this out. Uh, I'd like to have more work towards more of a kind of what we call, you know, call a treatment. Um, and so even though we, even though the kind of plan, we didn't really stick to it in yeah. the end, but it was just something to- It was a skeleton in the hand. Yeah, exactly, on. exactly. But so we, yeah, and then, you know, beyond that just the the planning of like all the different things we were going to film and all the different people we were going to interview and just yeah it was a lot of you know it was a lot of detail a lot of hard hard work but you know what i mean a lot of hours of work of work um so yeah I, I think that was that was it other than that um I guess the, the other biggest surprise was the the expense beyond right because you get the I I got uh, I contracted Joe and the, the crew and so I was in my mind I was like okay well that's pretty much what the yeah. the, the expense is ninety percent yeah ex there. exactly yeah. but actually uh, there were just so many yeah. other bits and pieces that had to be you know so so budget was a bit of a <laughs> bit of a shock to the system as we went along but. But, uh, it's like building a house you like right you know i've done I've had a number of construction projects here and and you learn initially you're thinking like well the house will cost this well you don't realize the walls and the septic and <laughs> the driveway like a lot right. of times that's half the cost is not even the house itself but right. all the right. peripheral things exactly but and you don't know until you've done it exactly well, that's exactly right so you know if i if i if i do another one now i've got a much better sense yeah. of of uh, what we're what we're dealing with, so um, yeah, so that was that was uh, the other. And then when you took it to to market to try to to find distribution for that, what was that experience like? Was it harder than you thought? Easier than you thought? So yeah, I mean the well, I guess it's you know that's a it's also a good important point to like explain why we kind of went down that route because. The easy thing would have been just like okay stick it on youtube and um you know and off we go and it would have been you know very easy yeah. and, and in some ways it's you know it, it's a hard choice to make because you know you, you can put it on youtube and then very easily anybody can access it and you know maybe that's maybe that's the way to go but we our um you know building on what i was saying earlier about this this kind of human story around Bitcoin, we wanted it to really go out to much more of a mainstream audience and not just be for the Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoiners. And so we th we thought, well, if we just stick it on YouTube and it just goes, you know, and we, it just gets retweeted and stuff by everyone in Bitcoin world, it's probably going to be 90% watched just by, by Bitcoiners, right? And so, uh, we decided why well, I ultimately decided that it was worth trying to go down a different route, a more traditional distribution route, whereby we could maybe end up getting it, you know, who knows, maybe, you know, in an ideal world, you know, maybe Netflix takes it and it's, uh, you know, premiere on Netflix, yeah. or whatever. But if it's not that, then maybe it's what, what we've ended up with, even, um, even though it may still end up on Netflix, but, um, well, I could see even when we have the the next run that them being much more interested in, right. in Bitcoin related. Uh, right, you know. exactly. Well, that was the yeah, time means everything with those things. Exactly. So that was, you know, that was, you know, in some ways kind of amazing. We did get a distribution deal because we were pitching it right in the depths yeah. of the bear market, <laughs> right? There's like zero interest from the outside world. Um, but uh, but yes, yeah, so we we made that choice of going down, kind of trying to go more traditional distribution. I had no experience in that, so I found a, uh, uh, a someone, a consultant, basically who works helps independent filmmakers try to find deals, and um, and so I found him like just doing on you know watching interviews on YouTube and stuff. And so I contracted him, another extra, <laughs> extra cost. Um, but he was, uh, I, I, he was very good and a, a very, the, the first thing was that he said, well, look, I, I'll, let me see your film and I'll decide whether I want to help you or not. You know, he doesn't take everything. Yeah, doesn't want to represent something that yeah, is trash. Exactly. 
And so he came back and said, wow, I think it's a fantastic film. And uh, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to uh, represent it and try and pitch it. So I was like, okay, that's a good start. And um, anyway, yeah, so he, he did that. He was the one who kind of went and pitched it to all these different companies and distributors. And um, yeah, I came back fairly, it all happens fairly, well, getting the, the, the offer happens fairly quickly. Um, and then it's a it's actually a, a long process once you've got the offer to then signing the agreement and then actually for it being released. A lot of details. To yeah, be, uh, a lot of details to be exactly yeah. ironed out. And then and then even once you've signed it, they you know they're thinking like months months ahead, so at least six months kind of ahead. So it's a long you know gestation period to to uh, for it to actually get out into the world, but. Um, but yeah, so um, we got the we got the deal, and um, it's not you know th th this is a big learning curve I guess yeah. from a yeah, from yeah. a is that there's like you say there's really very very difficult for an independent filmmaker to make make money. So you know when you say when I say get a deal, it's not like they come in and buy you know. No, they no, spend no, no. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I still, I, I, it's funny. I still get. I had a book that that. I co-authored that was released like 20 years ago. I still get like reports sent quarterly. And I think they gave us, I don't know, it was like $20,000 up front. And we've earned like, we're still in an, in the negative of like 15,000. Like <laughs> so they're, they're every month they're like, yeah, it's 10 cents more towards the, the money that we gave you up front that right. we shouldn't have. Right. <laughs> What was the book about? Uh, it was called Four Souls, uh, Search for Epic Life. Uh, myself and and three other guys after we finished um, university, we spent a year just traveling around the world. Like we drove from uh, California down to Guatemala in a pickup truck that somebody donated for uh, to be used as an ambulance. We were in Russia, Siberia, China. India, like traveling around, working with different churches and nonprofit groups. And right. so it was more of a story of the lives of the people we, I mean, it's in a lot of ways, it's what led to Bitcoin Beach because right. it gave me a love for travel. It gave me a love for like being in a community. And so I don't think if I wouldn't have done that trip that I would have. Uh, right. So it, wow. it definitely, you know, did a lot of things for me, but it also made me see that being in the book business or any of those businesses, like <laughs> even even I think a lot of the, you know, very popular authors that write things now, they don't make their monies on the book. Like that's what gets them speaking engagements right. or other, you know, consulting deals or things like that. Yeah. But book sales or just media sales in general, unless you're like at the top, top. Yeah, there's just not that much money in it. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. I but it gives you a platform, right? Exactly, and um, that that was the thing, you know, uh, you know. And to be honest, there was never there was there was no um, commercial yeah, incentive yeah. from the beginning, right? That's why you know we did the deal that if if there were any profits by any chance, then ninety percent of those would get donated to uh, to Bitcoin Beach and and the, the community projects that yeah. you guys are doing. So. I wanted, you know, needed, even though I didn't really anticipate that meaning a lot of money getting coming your way, it was obviously very. Yeah, and you never know. I mean, once in a while, things yeah, like yeah, you exactly. have that thing come out of nowhere and, and make it happen. That was, yeah, yeah I know the deal that, that you set up was was very generous and very well, thankful for that. But but much more for, than that, for me, just the material and getting the story out, like that's what I saw as important because having such a professionally well done, but getting the human out, like you were saying earlier, like this is how Bitcoin is impacting lives of people who need it most. Right, exactly. And that, that for me was also the, the, the whole point was to, to, uh, to get the story out. That was, you know, obviously the big, the big motive. And, um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, here was a, an example of, of people that were, yeah, I mean the, the whole because it's 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 interesting, right? The 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 different use cases of Bitcoin, and, and when people talk about Bitcoin adoption, and and just how different it, the adoption is happening for in in all kinds of different ways, yeah. right? For different reasons. For different reasons, exactly. And so you've got um, you know you've got Michael Saylor and uh, leading the way of you know 
corporations adopting it to have on, on their balance sheets. You've got, you know, BlackRock now probably going to be the one, you know, getting the, the first ETF, which is going to drive kind of Wall Street and all the, you know, invest investment in, into it there. And then you've got, you've got a lot of us uh, types who are kind of, uh, let's say, come from the developed world and are thinking more about it as a kind of long term, you know, uh, store of value, I guess, really. And then you've got the unbanked, right? The so-called unbanked, which is El Zonte and El Salvador and much of the, you know, so many other countries like that. So these just very, very different kinds of, uh, of use cases. And, and so, yeah, and that's, they're the ones right now who have a, an immediate benefit from it. And so it was, yeah, it was, uh, amazing to be able to, to, uh, you know, bring that out and in, into in the film and and showcase that. One thing I still don't really understand is in the Bitcoin space, these people get in fights about which which it is. Is it just is it a store of value? Is it digital money? And it's like they don't take away from each other. It's all of these things. Yeah. And it, they're actually synergistic. Like it, the fact that it's digital gold that you can also easily buy your coffee with makes it more valuable as digital gold. Right. So you have some people who get mad, like, oh, you shouldn't tell people to spend their Bitcoins. It's like, <laughs> if you're not using it, if it doesn't have that aspect, it's not worth as much as digital gold. Like right. it's, that, that's what I don't get. I don't yeah. understand everybody's in their little silo of what they think, so, think it should be. It's like, no, it's Bitcoin. It's all of these things. Yeah, well, I have to say like coming coming back to El Zonte or to El Salvador, but, and being able to actually pay for things with Bitcoin, it's great. I mean, it really, it, it makes you feel like kind of warm inside, you know, you get that kind of warm buzz of like, oh, this is, uh, so I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I, as much as uh, I have a kind of hodling, you know, mentality, I, I love, you know, transacting as well, you know? And so you just got to manage yeah. that. Obviously you don't want to go and blow all your Bitcoin, uh, but you still have to live. You have to buy food. You have to right. do things. So why not exactly. do it with the world's best exactly. money? And that's uh, that is the thing. Is it is it has different use cases for different types of people in different places, and we should be cool with yeah. that. That's you know. And um, so I'm curious as to your take on you, you bring up an interesting subject because I had somebody send me a Reddit post the other day that somebody had traveled to El Salvador, you could tell they were like a genuine Bitcoiner and they were kind of disappointed. They said that they felt like, you know, they they expected they'd be able to use Bitcoin in a lot more places. And they said even in El Zante, they found a number of places tell them that they wouldn't accept Bitcoin. For me, that was kind of surprising, but I'm like, well, maybe I'm just living in my own little bubble and I shop at all the places I shop and they all take Bitcoin. And so, I'm curious, what what have you found being here in El Zante? Do you feel like most people accept Bitcoin or do you feel like it's lost any momentum or it's gaining momentum or what? what's your take? Well, I have i don't think it's lost momentum. I I haven't been turned down anywhere yet by, uh, you know, I, I'm not gonna pretend I've been like going from yeah. one merchant to another, you know, like it's not, I haven't, been, uh, I've only been here a couple of days this time. So, but every everything that I have paid for, I've been able to pay with Bitcoin. So, uh, and including a couple of places that didn't before. So, um, Michanti, uh, where I'm staying, yeah. they didn't used to accept it, and um, I think Garten didn't used to accept it either. And I think Garten was one of the first ones, but maybe not. It it, it was a little bit harder. You had to find the owner, and you had okay. uh, where now it's like just baked into their system. Right, right. I think uh, I think the first time I came Garten didn't oh, really? didn't okay. accept it. Um but but um yeah, so no, I I don't think it certainly hasn't lost lost momentum. You know, people people have get expectations, right? And and probably above and beyond what they should be. I I probably had uh, my expectations were probably a bit too high when I first came as well. And I uh you know, I came to El Zonte in, as I say, back in 2021, and I was expecting, you know, kind of everything to be, to be, you know, everyone to accept it and everything. Um, but you, you know, you, you, okay, lower, okay, it's not quite, quite there yet, but could see that it was, 
And um, yeah, I do, you know, I for me is you, you just got to manage. You know, it's just people people who get over. Um, you know, you, expectations get too high. And, yeah. and, and it's not, it hasn't replaced the dollar. People aren't turning away yeah. dollars, but um, it, I, I use, I don't use dollars anymore just because it's just easier. Right. I mean, uh, you know, I always have my phone with me and it's exactly. Uh, so, but I, but it's, it's good to hear. Cause I was like, well, maybe I need to go around and, and <laughs> just try to buy things from all these places. Maybe I'm, I'm missing something, but I also know sometimes people come in and they, like I said, if they think it's going to be only Bitcoin, then they're disappointed. It's, you can have the same group of people and like one person will be like, wow, this is way more than I expected. Right. And that person's exactly. like, oh man, this is not nearly what I expected. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's very subjective based on, on expectations. Yeah. Um, but uh, but you feel like coming back, even since you've shot the the film, you feel like you've seen a transformation in El Zante. Well, I mean, definitely you've seen a, a transformation in other ways, right? Yeah. You can see there's all sorts of stuff happening in El Zante that wasn't happening before. So, just even you know, in terms of bringing in additional investment, more people coming, and so you know, from infrastructure, roads being built to you know, new bars, restaurants sprouting up. It's, well, it's crazy if you go in the morning, it used to be that, you know, in the morning the buses would come and they'd pick people up from El Zante to take them to their jobs elsewhere. Now everybody's coming into El Zante right. on the buses to, <laughs> you know, because they just can't find enough workers for right. what's happening. Here. Yeah, no, exactly. I was, I was thinking about that yesterday. I saw all these people like building the roads and stuff and I was thinking, wow, there must be, you know, because, not just El Zonte, but there's so much happening in El Salvador now that, you know, it's like, it's amazing that they do have, an, if they do have enough workers to be building all these new, all these new development projects, right? Um, but- uh, how, how long's it been since you were here? Well, one year. One well, year, okay. oh, actually no, cause, uh, well, so one year ago I, I came only uh, for, I only went to San Salvador, I think. What did I come to El Zonte briefly? But, but it was a, it was a, very short visit just uh, for the adopting Bitcoin. And, and do you feel like just in that year, like you come back and it's like, whoa, what's going on? Here? Yeah, just, yeah. Even just in that year, things have definitely, definitely changed. Um, there, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot, a lot more happening. And yeah, but on the Bitcoin side, I, yeah, I, I, I think it's probably more or less sort of similar to where it was before maybe even slightly better in terms of people accepting. Yeah. Um, obviously, I think the the real challenge is outside of El Zonte, right? And the rest, we know there's obviously this uh, new community in Berlin. That's yeah, yeah. Really, Super exciting to see that. Yeah, happen. exactly. I I was uh, listening to your um, interview with Charlie Stevens. Is it Charlie Stevens? Yeah. I know it's Sam's Charlie. I can't remember yeah, his last name. Yeah, I think name, it's Charlie. Yeah. Char Irish, Irish guy, right? Yes, the, and, uh, the Irish Spanish speaker. Yeah, he, he disappointed me though with his Spanish. I was hoping <laughs> it would have an Irish accent. Uh, so yeah, you know, it sounds like a very cool, very cool project. Um, but uh, but yeah, so there's you know there's a long way to go for Bitcoin to to really uh, become you know fully kind of adopted yeah. in El Salvador. I think maybe we all had higher expectations than we should have done at the beginning. But, but realistically, it was never going to happen yeah. straight away, right? It was just, you know. Um, I think it's too dependent on how you're wired. I'm I'm just wired more as a pessimist. So I'm always like, wow, this actually works. It's, <laughs> I mean, the fact that it's sustained and grown through a bear market to me is like, wow. Yeah. I'm actually kind of shocked. And I'm a little bit scared of what it's going to be like once we get into the next bull run. Because yeah. We, when we started the project, we had a little bit of that. And it it was, you saw people get that FOMO and, and like, oh, I'm gonna sell my property to buy Bitcoin. We're like, no, 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 that's not the point. Like, and yeah. so that's, that's what I'm more concerned about is like, are we gonna be ready for this next bull run to make sure that people manage their move to a Bitcoin standard in a like responsible way that doesn't upend things. I think that's going to be the biggest challenge. Exactly. Especially, you know, for the local yeah. people, right? Where, where, I mean, that, that's one of the big criticisms that gets thrown at Bitcoin and the whole El Salvador story is that, 
you know, the, the, the volatility is going to hit the, you know, it's all very well, then getting all these locals on board when there's a bull market. But what happens, you know, when Bitcoin plunges 80%, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's going to hit them very hard. And I mean, and we, we've seen that. I mean, it, we, they've, they've gone through that and it's, it has caused some uncomfortable situations, but it's actually, I think, been managed surprisingly like well. There hasn't been any huge disruptions. And I actually think it was good because as we go into the next bull market, they have that will help them, you know, be a little bit more, you know, from going all in and borrowing money to buy Bitcoin and that sort of thing. I'm, I'm hoping the fact that El Salvador already lived through. Yeah, more uh, cautious. A bear yeah. market that really hit right after they adopted. I yeah. mean, they, they adopted it and they went into a bear market. So from that point, the timing didn't look great. But I think actually in the long run, that's going to be amazing timing because it helped people be a little more tempered and, and yeah. you know, have just lower their expectations a little bit. Yeah, and I, th I think... I think the criticism is misplaced as well. I think it's unfair because it sort of underestimates, you know, the the ability on the Salvadorians' part to to think through these yeah. things and to manage manage those problems. You know, I think when you come from a very poor background, if you don't have a lot of excess money, you're you're not going to be just throwing it all into something, right? You're going to be cautious. And so, I from what the, my experience when we made the film, talking to to locals, I mean, at, at that point, admittedly, the you know the price was still still doing well. But then we came back again and spoke to, you know, spoke to people. It it was you know that they didn't, they weren't getting over uh, overly carried yeah. away. And and to your point, like just you know throwing everything they had into it, precisely because they're you know they come from a background of having to be very careful about how they spend their money, and so. So yeah, I, I think it was a, a not a not a well you know well placed criticism really. I I think that you, you underestimate their ability to to think through volatility and and, and manage that. And uh, so yeah, what have you noticed just as far as the the sense of safety and security and stuff? Because when you guys were filming, things were 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 still. I think El Salvador was still in the top 10, you know, murder rates in the world. It was still a time that there was a lot of challenges here. You know, obviously yeah. there's, things have turned around quite a bit. So as you kind of somebody who pops in, you know, every year, what's what's your gauge on that? Do you sense a difference in the people and their oh, attitudes and, yeah, and what you see at night and that sort of thing? Definitely, definitely. I just, yeah, it's light, light and day. I mean, the, when we were filming... It's, there was, you know, the, the improvement had started, but it was still, you know, a very much an issue. And I remember being told we have to be careful about where we go. We have to be careful about what we say sometimes, uh, who we talk to. Uh, I remember we went to, we went and filmed in uh, La, La Libertad and we got out of the car. And the very first thing we saw was a bunch of bullets on the on the ground. We we're like, OK, right, this is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is still, this, you know, there's uh, still some dangerous, uh, dangerous stuff going on. So, uh, yeah, it was, um, and we had a, we had one incident. We was we rented a house in Atami area, right? And there was one night where we woke up and the door was kind of I remember that. wide I remember open, that. yeah, and. Uh, we thought we, we to this day we're not really sh sure, but we thought someone had broken in during the night, and um, and then you know we were like, oh, we got kind of <laughs> panicky, and the the guy to his credit, just it's the first thing he did was put up a like a almost like a military grade <laughs> fence all around the all around the house. Um, and uh, it may have we may have just been one of us leaving the door open, <laughs> uh, but um, but no, there was you know there was that sense of like uh, there was definitely a sense of still a bit of danger, right? Uh, in the and but since then, yeah, it's incredible the change, and and now really don't feel that at all. And obviously, we've we now know the the data as well, right? The statistics on 
what's happened in terms of the safety of the country. And, you know, again, it's a, <clears throat> a topic of discussion, right? That's some criticism comes, uh, at, you know, always seems to be from the same, same, uh, through the same channels um, about how that's been managed and how that's been done. And, uh, but uh, I, you know, I don't subscribe to that. I think there is, you know, there's no perfect w way yeah. to, to deal with a situation like that. And I, I, for, for me, there's things that concern me. There's the, for sure people in jail that, that are innocent, but I, the other option was to just let the gangs continue to control everything. They couldn't have come in without overwhelming force and solve the issue. Just the incremental way they were recruiting new members faster than they could put people you know, in jail. And so it was one of those things they either had to be willing to live with the gangs controlling everything or know that they were going to come in and there was going to be some collateral damage like there isn't any war. And so I would have hated to have to be the one making those decisions. But I think if you look at the bigger picture and the number of lives that have been improved versus those that have been negatively impacted, I, I think there's really no comparison. And obviously, if you're one of the innocent that are being affected, that's, you know, doesn't make it better for you. But I think as a leader that has to think of their country as a whole, uh, I think they've done the impossible. What everybody said was impossible. They've succeeded in doing. Yeah, absolutely. I I don't see any other way. I, I really don't. I it's uh, there's there's just no there is no perfect way of doing it. And you you know as I I've, I've mentioned this before. There's a the way I see it is like there's a there's a kind of a spectrum right of like of like perfection, which is pretty much impossible. Where you, where you, not a single innocent person gets, uh, you know, goes to jail, and then at the other end is, you know, a, a complete um, shit show. And, yeah. and and I think they've got, you know, very close, you know, to towards one end. Not it's not perfect, but you know, when you think about the, the what, how it's improved the Salvadorian society as a whole and as a country as a whole, and you think about the happiness and and um, satisfaction and of the vast majority of the people it's 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 incredible i you know f for me one of the one of the most striking moments not moments but uh, let's say a series of moments is issues with in making the film was not just not just the people that we were filming but because you know we spent you know several weeks over a month in el salvador and so just talking to people all the time, whether it was drivers, whether it was the owner of the house, whether it was, you know, a, a cleaner, whether it was someone, uh, you know, in the pupusa uh, restaurant, just kept hearing these stories of, you know, oh, well, I lost my brother, you know, to the gangs. I lost my my son or my, you know, it was, it was just so many stories of of people with uh, you know bereavement stories and it was tragic you know and i so much worse than i had realized i mean i knew that el salvador had been through a lot of problems but i didn't yeah. know that, no it was horrific yeah it was horrific and uh so to see that change yeah. that transformation is is being amazing well and, and you think of the tens of thousands of young people that have been saved from entering the gangs because it used to be for a lot of them the kind of path of least resistance and so now you have this like pathway that's been cut off so for me that's one of the biggest things i think people are overlooking is all these future generations that are being saved by the fact that nobody wants to be part of the gangs anymore because the consequences are so real. And I don't think they could have cut off that pipeline without doing what they did. Yeah. So while I struggle with it, while I think it's okay for us to question the things, I think we need to look at the bigger picture of, of the number of lives that have been improved because of it. Absolutely, yeah. I and mean, one of the themes of the, the actual documentary is about the, the, the amount of people that were just trying to f flee the country, oh, yeah. right? And so starting with, you know, kind of Jorge and Chimbera deciding not to do that. And, you know, everybody else was just trying to get to the US. And and so that was became, a you know, quite a, a big theme of the film was was uh, 
their their decision to to stay yeah. and try and change their country and you know to to follow their dream of improving their their country and then you know you know to see to see that that now all these people are coming back and it's kind of going the other way yeah you know is is just it's know, incredible it's magical it really is. yeah so i love how in the, the film you guys start off you know talking with the mother who you know had to make that hard choice to to leave right and you know not be able to see her son grow up and you know, yeah now seeing that you know parents don't have to make those type of hard decisions yeah so it's, yeah no it was that was an amazing uh it was again one of those things that kind of fell into place, right? Because we we uh, said we we want to speak to one of the the lifeguards, right? We wanted to the go, we're going through the lifeguard pro the Bitcoin Beach lifeguard program, and so we didn't we hadn't organized that with Chimbera or anybody, and so we were just walking along the beach uh, one day, and we just happened to see this guy who was you know, and he had kind of long long uh, curly hair and. Moises is his name, and uh, we just went up to him and said, "Hey, you know, we're looking to talk to a lifeguard about, you know, their experience." And, uh, and he was like, "Yeah, yeah, okay, you know." And so we ended up doing this, and and it just turned out that he happened to have a mother in Houston who had left 15 years beforehand, and you know, left him there. And there was this, and we ended up going to Houston, so we were able to film his mother as well. Yeah, and yeah, so no, was, I love how you guys tied that together. Yeah. So this is Moises right there. That's Moises, exactly, right. I don't know, do we have any video clips, Andy? That, that, um, so yeah, just to bring that kind of life story of, you know, and, and interviewing his mother actually in Houston. Yeah. And him down here. Yeah, exactly. It was, um, uh, yeah, it was, that was a super, super cool uh, part of the, yeah, yeah. one of my favorite parts of the whole film actually was that those two talking about yeah. each other it was just you know what one of the things i really wished we'd been able to do but it was impossible was um bring his mother back to uh to, to be because yeah. he was at the film right at the premiere we yeah, did the, we yeah, did the yeah. premiere in and so i was like oh wouldn't it be amazing because it you know he's like oh what, what's my dream to see my mother again right and so it would have been awesome yeah. of course she got into the us you know without papers yeah. and so it was impossible um so no and there's so many people with, with stories like that right but yeah it, yeah in this state of limbo well we could go on talking about the film for for hours and it's great catching up i, I think we're supposed to be at the speaker's dinner right, <laughs> right. now uh, <laughs> yeah. as, as usual but i want to make sure that if there's anything we missed and uh that you make sure and, and highlight that and then make sure where people know how one where they can watch the film, but also how they can help promote it or other things they can do to help get the story out. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't think we really missed anything. I think worth worth saying a couple of things, which um, is I I think I believe that this may be the biggest film to have come out of El Salvador about El Salvador um, in terms of kind of budget. And I mean, there's one other documentary i mean there's been lots of little documentaries yeah. but in the last couple of years but there was one uh i think about the kind of civil war and so on that became quite quite a sort of big thing we actually took a couple of clips from that and but i think it's the biggest film that's come out about el salvador and i also think that probably based on what i've seen that it may be the biggest kind of budget film that's really ever been made about with a with bitcoin at the heart of it um I've not seen many films, if any, where you can see a crew has been on the ground somewhere for many weeks and, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and I think it's probably the first that's had like a proper distribution deal. And so, I mean, <clears throat> just in terms of that, in terms of how it can be watched, you know, it's, um, it's out on, it, it just depends on where you are in the world. Yeah. If you're in the US, it's on like many platforms, it's on, every cable uh, TV network, it's on the big satellite TV networks, then it's on Amazon and Apple. And so uh, they just put Dare to Dream in there, they'll be able to. Well, they, they, they need to put Dare to Dream, a story from El Salvador, okay. uh, just because there is another film called Dare to Dream. Um, so yeah, you need to put the full title in, but then yeah, it'll come up. 
And and then if you're not in the US, it's you know it's one way or another, it's available any everywhere in the world. And the best way to to find that is to go to our website, which is uh, dare to dream hyphen film dot com. And on the news uh, page, we have information about where the, you know, which platforms where it can be watched, okay. depending on where you are in the world. In fact, if you're not in because the, the distributor has the exclusive rights for uh, US, Canada and Caribbean. If you're outside of those regions, you can also buy it with Bitcoin off the website itself. Um, so you'll find that on the website. So yeah, so that data dream hyphen film dot com. And then, yeah, my, you know, uh, I'll make sure we get the right Twitter one. I, uh, <laughs> I, know, you, I know you lost the original Twitter handle yeah, and I uh, yeah. mistakenly posted that. Yeah, day, no so. worries. No, but I, yeah, it was really frustrating that I, I mean, not that I, I hadn't managed to build up a huge following or anything, but I had, you know, build up a little bit of a following and taken a long time. And then just after the film came out, I got locked out of the account because it was it was connected to a phone number from Dominican Republic where I was where I was before. Anyway, I now have the, yeah, the different uh, Twitter handle X as it's uh, now called, um, which is at Bitcoin underscore films with okay. an S on the end. Um, so, so make sure that you're following that and make sure uh, you're following so that you and go and watch, try and out. try and watch the film. And, and if you like it, we all, you know, if you, if you enjoy it, we, you know, feedback is really important to us. Well, even if you don't enjoy it, it's just good to get, <laughs> <laughs> good to get feedback and yeah, sp you know, spread the word and, uh, yeah, hope, uh, hope, hope people enjoy it. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you uh, making it in here and uh, well, thank hope you. the rest of your week goes well and we'll have to revisit next time you're, you're here and get some more updates. For sure. Well, thank you. And I really appreciate you uh, having me on and uh, yeah, great to catch up. And yeah, we'll, uh, we'll no doubt be uh, seeing more of each other over the next few days. And yeah, thank you. Thank you once again.